our sermon series on apologetics. And if Brody's stories weren't apologetic enough for you, that uh, encouraging you about the miracles that God is doing, um, we're going to talk today about science and faith. And um, as Brody shared, and as, as a number of us have experienced, we serve the God of the miraculous. We serve the God who can who created science, who created the world, who can do anything in the world, and can do anything through us by his Holy Spirit. And so today I'm going to be looking at kind of a, a scientific, philosophical approach to this question, um, but I want us to realize that we serve the God of the supernatural. We don't have to live in the scientific, in the philosophy realm. Uh, we can serve the God of the supernatural in a supernatural way. So. I want to share just a bit about my story. Uh, I grew up in the church. I grew up as a pastor's kid. And I went off to university, to a secular university. And when I went to university, I was so challenged about my faith. Um, I, was, I was with people who came from different Christian traditions. I was also in classrooms with people who weren't Christian and had all sorts of other philosophical ideas about the world, scientific ideas about the world. And I just felt totally bombarded, like, it really forced me to question, do I really understand my faith? Do I really believe these things? And so during my time in university, I spent a lot of time uh, watching apologetics videos. And if you don't know what apologetics is, it's basically just giving a rational defense of your faith. And so I, I ended up watching a lot of these videos, and it really helped me to realize that as Christians, we don't have to leave our brains on the shelf when we, when we become Christians. We don't have to put our brains over there and say, we're just going to blindly follow God in, when there's no evidence. Um, it helped me to realize that there is a lot of, not just uh, evidence about miracles and these kinds of things, but there's also evidence in different fields of science. There's evidence in philosophy. There's evidence in some of these academic disciplines that that we serve an intelligent creator and he created the world. So um, as we do this series, I want us to, to just be careful that we don't put all of our weight in apologetics. Because I remember during that time, I, I basically felt like this was the reason for my faith, that, that science proves, proves God's existence and philosophy proves God's existence. But what apologetics does is it helps us kind of remove some of these mental barriers so that we can follow Christ wholeheartedly. So it's, it's a way of kind of removing barriers in our mind so that we can, we can serve the living God. Okay, so it's, um, we don't want to forget that our life with Jesus is a relationship to be cultivated. It's not a philosophy to be, to be defended. Okay, we always need to keep that at the forefront. Uh, that, that this life with Christ is a relationship. All right. So with that being said, we're going to look at faith and science. Oh, this has been so interesting. Is anyone interested in science? We've got some scientists in, in the room, I know. It's so interesting. There's so many different fields of science. There's so many uh, different places we could talk about uh, sci science and faith. So I struggled to put this together. There was, there was so much I could say. But I found it so interesting just doing a little bit of research into, into different uh, fields of science. So, are, fi are, are faith and science opposed? I think you know what I'm going to answer. But, but for a long time, there's, there's kind of been this idea floating around in the Western world that science and faith are somehow in conflict with each other. And this, this kind of floats around in school and universities. It kind of floats around in practical conversations you have with people. And not everyone says it outright and says, science is legitimate, faith is not. But you often pick up on these nuances when you're having conversations with people. And when I was in university, I always felt like people who were in scientific disciplines felt like, my science is solid. Science is rational. It's based on evidence. And faith, yeah, you can, you can explore faith if you want. It's kind of your own thing. Uh, you do your faith, and it, it felt like they were discrediting it, saying it's just flaky. Uh, whatever you believe, you believe, that kind of thing. And we kind of hear this language, don't we, about your truth. That's just your truth, and that's okay. You can believe your truth. And so I always kind of felt like, well, maybe I need to dig into this a little bit more. 
And so uh, I don't know if you've sensed that. Has anyone ever, uh, anyone else sensed that, that some people just feel like, ah, oh, faith is more flaky, whereas science is solid and rigorous? Yeah? Um, so not everyone says this explicitly, but some people do. There's a well-known atheist, probably the most well-known atheist in the world right now is Richard Dawkins. And he wrote a book called The God Delusion. And he says, faith is a delusion, which he says, faith is a persistent false belief that's held in the face of strong contradictory evidence. That's pretty bold to say every person of faith in the world is deluded. <laughs> that's a pretty bold statement. Uh, but he says this, and again, not everyone says it strongly, but I sense that there's this, there's this general idea that floats around occasionally that science and faith are in conflict. So I want to squash this idea today. I just want to squash it and, and put it to rest that science and faith are not in conflict. Uh, we serve the God who created science. And as we explore science, I believe that science actually gives us a ton of evidence for an intelligent creator, a rational creator, an all-powerful creator. So where to even start? We're gonna start at the scientific revolution. All right, so put your history hats on. We're gonna be exploring a little bit of history this morning. So the scientific revolution, this took place during the 16th and 17th century, and it largely took place in the Western world. And this was a period in time when science really, ex, ex, uh, sorry, science really just kind of blew up and advanced in exponential ways. So uh, this was really the time period when the scientific method was really developed and, and really used a lot, the method of testing a hypothesis to see if it's true. Um, there was a real strong emphasis during this time in studying things empirically, doing experiments, scientific experiments, that kind of thing. And along with this, what made this possible was there was a lot of inventions during this time period. So the telescope, that's a pretty big invention. Uh, the microscope, Imagine that, being invent, inventing that and being the first person to look through a microscope at a small organism. The barometer, the thermometer, the pendulum clock, the air pump, the balance spring watch. These are all incredible advancements, incredible inventions that took place during this time period that really helped people to understand the, the way that the world works. So obviously these just helped us to really increase our scientific knowledge of the world. And so this all happened during this time period in the scientific revolution. Now there's, a, there's kind of this common misconception that before this time period, the world was kind of guided by these religious fanatics who believed all sorts of weird things about the world. They believed that the earth was the center of the solar system. They believed that uh, all the earth didn't rotate, all these different things. And then these atheist, secular scientists came and proved them all wrong, that religion was garbage. Well, this is not how it worked. This is not what happened. In fact, all of the, uh, uh, most of the giants during the, the scientific revolution were Christian, deeply committed Christians. So I'm just gonna say a couple names and you'll probably recognize these names. Isaac Newton, anyone ever heard of Isaac Newton? <laughs> Mathematician, physicist, basically, uh, articulated the laws of motion so that we can understand physics. Uh, Galileo, an astronomer who was, he was uh, deemed a heretic by the Catholic Church because, because of his views. Uh, well, he was drawing on Copernicus's views about the sun being the center of the universe. And, and so he, he did receive some persecution from religious authorities about this. But he was a deeply committed Christian as well. Blaise Pascal, a mathematician, physicist. Francis Bacon, who's considered by many, many to be the father of the scientific method. Isn't that crazy? He also has a great last name, Francis Bacon. <laughs> Makes me hungry. Uh, just incredible, intelligent people who were really the pillars of the scientific revolution were com deeply committed Christians. Uh, Galileo, or sorry, Sir Isaac Newton says, says this. He says, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Francis Bacon on the screen there, he talked about 
science and religion kind of as, or, or science and faith kind of like two books. He says that God gave us kind of two ways of learning about him. One was through the scripture, that his, his revelation to us through scripture. And also as we study science, we're studying, uh, we're studying God, we're learning about him. And maybe that's not the best way to articulate it, but, but he's right. As we study nature, we just see how incredible God is. Uh, scriptures say that uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. And as we study scripture, we see that, or so as we study the world, we just, they declare God's glory, his, his majesty, his incredible intellect. And so these, a lot of these thinkers pursued science because of their faith. They said God created an, a world that we can actually understand because God made us in his likeness, in his image. He made us with the capability of understanding the things that he's created. And so that led them to pursue science. And they did not see it as in conflict at all with their faith. So those are some big names. There's a lot of big names to, today of scientists that are, are, are really solid scientists that are Christians as well. Dr. Francis Collins, he was the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. I can barely say that. Uh, he basically was helping lead uh, the project that mapped human DNA. Uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer is really fun to listen to. He's such a brilliant person, scientist. Dr. James Tour, Dr. Alistair McGrath, John Lennox. These are all p thinkers that you might want to watch on YouTube. They're really fascinating, really interesting. So all this to say that you don't have to leave your brain on the shelf when you become a Christian. And, and for many of us, we're not scientists. Some of us are, but many of us are not scientists. So when someone comes to us and, and says, this, this scientific theory proves that God does not exist, um, we can go to some of these thinkers and watch their videos or learn from them and, and realize that, oh, maybe there are good good other explanations. Maybe some of the dominant theories, scientific theories that are, that are pervasive right now are not all that they're cracked up to be. So we, can, we don't have to be afraid of science. I wanna say it like that. We don't have to be afraid. If a theory comes up that challenges our faith, we don't have to be afraid. We can explore it. We can be intellectually honest and, and, and seek these things out. Okay, so after the scientific revolution, um, during the period of the Enlightenment, which was kind of in the 17th and 18th, 18th centuries, uh, there, there appeared to be kind of the rise of atheistic thinking and, and secularism. So a lot of, in universities, higher level thinkers, a lot of them started to think uh, in secular ways and kind of dismissed the idea of God's existence. So you might know some of these names like Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, Voltaire, Charles Darwin. Anyone heard of these names? These are pretty well-known atheist uh, philosophers or scientists or psychologists. And they popularized a lot of theories that were atheistic or naturalistic, if you, if you want to use that word. And so a lot of these theories actually took root and people, people really held on to them because a lot of them actually do have bits of truth in them. They have elements of truth to these theories. Um, but, but a lot of these thinkers totally rejected God and said he doesn't belong in the picture. Now, uh, Stephen Meyer, I've been listening to a lot of him, and he says there were, there were three great discoveries in the, in the 20th century that really led a lot of scientists to go back to God and to be open to belief in God and because of the science. So these scientific, discover scientific discoveries led scientists to say, uh, maybe we should go back to the God hypothesis that, that there is an intelligent creator of our universe. So there's many more discoveries, but these are three big ones. The first one is the, the, uh, the um, discovery that the universe had a beginning. So uh, the, a lot of people call this the Big Bang, that at the beginning of the universe, there was a beginning moment. Before this, before this was discovered, in the 20th century, a lot of people believed that the universe was eternal. There were many different views. Some people believed the universe was eternal. Others believed that it, it did have a beginning. Um, but there was, there was a number of discoveries because of the Hubble telescope that proved that the universe had a beginning. 
I mean, there's still theories that say maybe it didn't, but, but a lot of scientists now believe that the universe did have a beginning moment. And has anyone read Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> this is what the scriptures say, that the universe had a beginning. It had a moment of uh, where God created it. And so, again, science is lining up with the Bible. That's coming into line with, with the scriptures. And so there's a number of, I'm not going to get into it, but there's a number of philosophical reasons that if the universe had a beginning, it, it shows that there must have been a, a creator. There must have been a being who created the universe that was outside of space and outside of time. And I'm not going to get into that argument right now, but, but this discovery really led a lot of philosophers to say, well, there must have been a cause. If the universe had a beginning, there had to be a cause for the universe. The next big discovery was the fine tuning of the universe. This is just, this blows my mind. The fine tuning of the universe. When physicists and cosmologists, people who study space, when, when um, a lot of our technology has really increased over the last number of years, and they've been able to, to study the conditions of the universe, which they're called the fundamental physical constants of the universe. So the fundamental physical constants. These are different um, constants in the universe that are, they're finely tuned like dials to exactly the right precision so that our universe can exist and that our universe can sustain life. So very finely tuned. So one example is the speed of light. The speed of light is a physical constant. Wherever you measure the speed of light, it's the same speed. Um, maybe some other factors can, can change it, but if it's in a, in a closed environment, it's exactly the same speed, it doesn't change. And so there's lots of these kind of constants throughout the universe that, are, that have a very specific precision. And if any of these constants is changed by just the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest amount, our universe wouldn't exist or there wouldn't be our universe wouldn't have life in the universe. So I'll give you just a couple of these. One is called the gravitational constant. The gravitational constant. So our gravity, the force of gravity, when I take this Kleenex and I drop it, that's gravity pulling it to the ground. If you didn't know that, <laughs> welcome to science. <laughs> That's gravity. So gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by one in 10 to the 60th, I've heard numbers higher than this, but, but one in 10 to the 60th power, our universe would have expanded so rapidly that no stars could form, or it would have collapsed in on itself. Now, that number is so gigantic that we probably don't really understand what that means. So, I heard someone explain it like this. If you take a measuring tape and you stretch it all the way across, not just this room, not just Waterloo, not just Canada, not just the world, if you stretch the measuring tape all the way across the known universe, the whole universe, and you pick one inch marker on that point, if the inch marker was moved to the right one inch, the universe wouldn't have life. If you moved it one inch to the left, it wouldn't have life. So imagine me stretching out a uh, measuring tape across the whole universe, and I pick a random point, and then I blindfold you, and I say, guess where I put the point? What are the chances that you're going to guess the exact point that I picked? It's just not, not going to happen. So this is just one constant, one finely tuned dial. There are there's over a hundred uh, constants. Um, so, and many of them are extremely finely tuned and can't be, can't be changed. So that's just incredible to me. That's just crazy to me that the universe is so finely tuned. And this happened at the moment, at the beginning of the universe, these constants were in place. Another one is the expansion rate. Uh, Stephen Hawking says this, if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, I don't even know what that number means, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back in on itself or never developed galaxies. 
And so Stephen Hawking himself, he's, he's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. He says, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been so finely adjusted to make possible the development of light. I was listening to a, an interview by Richard Dawkins and he said, he, he said the fine tuning of the universe is a good argument for God's existence. He didn't say he believes in God, but he said this is actually a good argument. He, had, he finally admitted something. <laughs> I was like, yes! <laughs> awesome. So this is one of the one of the incredible scientific discoveries that shows that our universe is so perfectly designed. It's, it's just so precise that um, it seems crazy to, to believe that uh, this was just totally random. The next discovery, there's so many of these I could say I had to pick three. So the digital information in DNA. Um, I'm going to show a video here because I can't explain this very well. So hopefully this video explains it better than I can. But this video is basically showing um, the process of how our DNA creates proteins. Okay, so this is happening in all of our bodies right now. Hopefully this works okay. Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most human cells, there is a structure called a nucleus. The nucleus contains the genome. In humans, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome reads the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain made up of amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acid. Transfer RNA molecules carry the amino acids to the ribosome. The messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid. This is added to a growing chain of amino acids. Once the last amino acid has been added, the chain folds into a complex 3D shape to form the protein. I know I feel like you're in high school again. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That is just one process that's happening inside of your body right now. That just blows my mind. I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but but our DNA has digital information that is read by different aspects of our body. And so it's digital information that is understood, uh, that is read, and that is used to create a protein. And so wherever you see digital information, you always, you always uh, assume that there was a, a rational mind behind that information. We always do, we all do. So if I walked into a factory and uh, I saw these robotic machines that were making a car, 
And then I saw on a computer, I saw this code that was typed into the computer, and then the robots started working. Um, I would not assume that a tornado blew in and knocked the, uh, knocked the lamp down and it hit the computer and it started typing things out and then all of a sudden this happened. It just would be crazy to think that. I wouldn't think that this guy here, this, this guy here programmed it, <laughs> even though he looks pretty professional. <laughs> I would not assume that a monkey typed the code out and the robots just all of a sudden started creating cards. It just doesn't make sense. Wherever we see digital information that, that is logical, that is coherent, and that produces a logical result, we always assume it's an intelligent creator. We always assume that there's an intelligence behind it. So when it comes to our bodies, all not just the DNA, but the complexity of our bodies, the, the digital information that's going on in our bodies. Um, to me, it's just crazy not to think that there was an intelligent creator who's behind it, to think there's some kind of intelligence behind our bodies. Again, what we just watched is one tiny, tiny part of what's going on in our bodies at a, at a micro level. So these are some of the reasons why people, why a lot of scientists, based on their science, say, man, I, I really believe there has to be an intelligent creator. There has to be. Or else how could we get to the place where we're at right now? To think that all of the, all of the things that are going on at a macro level and at a, uh, a macro level and a micro level are just the result of random processes, unguided processes, is just, it takes too much faith to believe that. It's too, it's too hard to believe that. So again, a lot of people are coming to the belief in God based on the science. So I hope these are just a couple small things. We have a few scientists in our, in our congregation as well that would be happy to talk about other explanations, other reasons uh, based on science why, why it's really rational to believe in an intelligent creator God. So I want to read a couple scriptures. Isaiah 40, verse 21 to 26. In this scripture, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. I mean, this image of stretching out the heavens to me is like our universe is expanding. He's stretching out the heavens like a canopy. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and re reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. I mean, after watching that video, who can we compare God to? Who is his equal? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who, he who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Isn't that incredible? He calls the stars out one by one. Do you know how many stars are estimated to be in our, gala in, in our universe? Billions of trillions, like a number that's just too, far, too hard to comprehend. To me, when I, when I learn about these scientific things, when I read these scriptures, uh, to me, the only response is worship. How can we understand just the, the incredible things that God has made and not worship and just say, Lord, you are so powerful. You are so worthy. You are so worthy. You are so intelligent. And this is exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. Revelation 4, verse 11, it says, You are worthy. This is in the throne room of God. It says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. As we look at the, God's creation, worship is just the result and this is what people have been doing for thousands of years. Since humans have been around, we've, we, in every culture, people are worshiping. They recognize that this world is so incredible. Uh, we need to worship. This is just our natural response. 
So worship is our response when we, when we understand the complexity of, of God's universe. And taking one more step further in this, here's another scripture. Psalm 103, verse 11. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. This is not just an intelligent creator who's distant from us, who's far off. This, the distance from the, heavens, uh, <laughs> from the heavens are above the earth, that's how much God loves us as we seek him, those who fear him, those who, who love him. God's love for us is that huge. If you don't understand how far that is, <laughs> I want to just give you a short example here. So this is the distance to the closest star to our sun, okay? Again, there's billions of trillions of stars. This is the closest star to our sun. If you traveled 700,000 kilometers an hour, which apparently some a new spaceship can go that fast, which is crazy. But if you go that fast, it would take 6,300 years to get to the closest star. That's pretty long. <laughs> 6,300 years just to get to the next star to ours. Just think of how giant our universe is. And then think of how much God's love is for us. That's how much his love is for us. That's how, how deep his love is for us. So I hope that's an encouragement to you. I hope that challenges you to start thinking theologically about science, about thinking about the world. Um, and I hope that spurs you on to worship. So I'm just going to close in prayer, and I'll invite the worship team to come up. And that will be our response. We will worship, worship the Lord. God, we thank you for who you are, God. You are worthy. Lord, you are worthy to receive all our praise. You're worthy to receive all of our lives, Lord. For you created everything, and by your will they were created and have their being. We thank you for the the complexity of the way that you made things, Lord, just shows your intelligence and your, your power. We thank you that you've created us with minds that can understand these things, Lord, that you've created us in your likeness. So, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to build our faith and our trust in you. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as, we, as many of us encounter different philosophies and different science theories and these kinds of things, that you would give us your wisdom. You give us your understanding. Lord, always help us to have that posture of worship towards you, Lord, that we can worship you and recognize that you created all things, that you are so incredible, and, and we just want to give you all praise and all glory, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.